Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. <coughs> Over in the boxed world of board games, I've rarely bought second-hand goods. Things are quite different in the alternative world of the role-playing game. Over in the RPG world, I've haunted the specialist game sites looking for historical documents that I could feature on this channel. Yes, I have the fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons. There are more than five editions of D&D, but that's neither here nor there. Historically, you must dig through murky clay to differentiate one edition from another. Noting art style and typesetting by decade, by century, will see you through for the most part. Only 2nd edition advanced Dungeons & Dragons and the pointless cash grab 3.5 version of the 3rd edition carry edition numbers on the covers. The first time I bought a D&D book was for comparison purposes. Looking to buy 5th edition, I decided I'd pick up 3rd edition for hysterical historical reasons. Yes, you can play the game without owning the rulebooks at all without even reading them at all if you can't borrow any. D&D &D wasn't the first role-playing game I tried, and it was very far from being the first one I bought. Which brings me to a D&D related topic. The main point of this video. Figures. Miniatures. In metal, plastic, or whatever material is next in line for greatness. I mention older editions of D&D &D and other role-playing game rule sets from the second-hand world of purchasing as those come with wear and its harsh companion, tear. In the grand scheme of D&D &D items, wear and tear are chaotic neutral, and that is a role-playing fact. If I want to buy a board game, I'll almost always buy one that's factory fresh. Generally, if I want a role-playing game, I'll also buy brand new. When I research a role-playing book from the hobby's deep lore, the ancient history, then I prefer to buy a used copy, an inevitably worn edition, rather than going for an electronic version. My research efforts go above and beyond the basic Wikipedia page, thanks very much. The third edition copy of D&D &D had second-hand remnants of gaming stashed inside, adding to the charm of a game that was actually used. You just don't get that from a PDF. I still sigh when I see the inevitable gaming tours of American basements stacked with multiple copies of the same board game in the original time-stamped shrink wrap. Again, I stress that I am not a collector in block capitals with a trademark sign added at the end. I have no interest in buying a game keeping it wrapped, and selling it on for profit. That way, madness lies. How you spend your money is your affair, as ever. But my advice is to take those games out of the mummified wrappings, perform the arcane rituals, and breathe life into the many pristine boxes, mint condition books, cardboard crates, and terrifyingly typeset tomes. Rip away the cellophane of celestial protection. Crack the spine on that book of exalted rules. Historical copies of games come with historical wear and historical tear. Nature of the world we live in. No way around that. So much for board games and role-playing rulebooks. When buying miniatures for role-playing games, I buy new. Occasionally, I buy damaged. You have to read the ultra-fine print very clearly when you walk the damaged path of retail. That thorn-strewed path leads to a shady glade in the deeper woods where you may find rare treasure. What are you buying when you buy damaged goods? Not damaged goods, damaged boxes. This is of greater importance when considering the purchase of a board game. Damage to a crushed board game box translates a little more easily to the game's components than does the damage that smacks into a box of miniatures. Consider that when buying official D&D figures by whiz kids. These boxes contain sturdy enough plastic interiors. Is there a safer way to pack miniatures? Ecologically, the role-playing games hobby is only close to eco-friendly if you don't use figures at all. You can sail by on a rulebook, writing materials, and a few sheets of paper. Hell, if you want sustainable dice, then go for dolphin-friendly wooden ones. There you are, sorted. Your carbon footprint is now nearer that of a dainty elf, than that of the lumbering Tarasque. I bought giant figures, damaged, and saved money. I'll recycle that money into another hobby purchase. The fine print informed me that only the packaging was damaged. Knowing WizKids for their inevitable extra layer of plastic protection, I felt secure in the knowledge that only the cardboard box had taken the hit. At worst, the inner plastic may have crumpled or split. But the goods, being looked after by packaging, wouldn't be bothered at all.
The day arrives when the parcel arrives. What a big box. This is the box the box comes in, and the inner box itself holds the plastic cocoon protecting the plastic miniatures. Large miniatures. Well, obviously, they are giant miniatures. I see the problem that isn't a problem to me. The box crumpled at the corner under the weight of something else in transit to the shopkeeper. But the figures themselves are fine, regardless. Why don't we check these out for hidden damage? I must stress this point about packaging. The smaller the figure is, the more likely that I recycle the packaging and place that figure in a compartmentalized piece of storage for ease of use. Larger figures, I might transfer those to bigger standardized storage boxes. When it comes to dragons, just to keep dust off the wings, well, they are already in their own relatively standardized storage boxes. If you're going after all the chromatic dragons for Dungeons & Dragons, the WizKids line will take up a fair chunk of a deep bookcase. The rest of the bookcase you'll most likely devote to the metallic dragons. Though you don't need to use miniatures of any description, just use description, it has to be said that the arrival of a dragon on the battlefield is always an event, and using a figure for a fearsome foe adds greatly to the atmosphere of the game. It isn't so much the cost of these expensive models, rather it's the amount of space you must dedicate to storing them. That's the massive problem. And that's without considering the difficulty of transporting larger figures to a venue. The smaller the figure, the better it is to break open the blister pack and send the packaging for recycling, so I'm not terribly fussed on boxes themselves. Dragon boxes are ideally suited for stacking on your heavy-duty bookcases. Dragons fear no dust when shielded by the cardboard of protection. The boxes are mostly the same size, depending on how the dragon wings and tails were sculpted. A few of those boxes picked up scrapes here and there. I didn't mind. And so, I don't care that this box of giants was crumpled in over there on that corner. The figures inside are unhurt. We'll leave it to players to hurt them in combat or find a way around the so-called inevitable fight. Dents and Dings isn't a role-playing game, though you'd be forgiving for thinking so. I saved over a tenner on the purchase price, temporarily making this box the cheapest option online. Know exactly what you're getting into when you buy and try to grab those bargains where you can. As sure as night follows day, you gets what you pays for. Mashed cardboard, obviously. Two mighty requirements overlapped. I wanted this particular box of giants. These are named characters from a specific adventure, and those always have a better impact on play than would generic monster figure number five and his equally generic minions. This guy is Count Strad. What was the second mighty requirement? I saw the reduced price. Oh, damaged box. That'll be nothing to worry over, and it wasn't. It's worth hitting these shop sites and typing damaged into the search field to see if anything of interest pops up. And if I had purchased a damaged figure in the end, being well versed in the modeling side of painting miniatures, I have the tools and paints to improvise a battle scarred version of a hero or a villain. If you add a touch of individuality to a mass produced figure, no one is going to put out a warrant for your arrest. No one credible. The D&D cops have no jurisdiction in any jurisdiction. Packaging is the bane of the role playing hobby. Well, that and getting all your players lined up to play the same adventure at the same time. Yes, if I sit and contemplate the true bane of the role-playing hobby, I will find a million banes and more. The true bane of the hobby is the hobby itself. Every dungeon master will tell you the game would go much more smoothly without the players. And that really is a role-playing fact about the attitude of dungeon masters. <laughs>